Well, it's exciting to come and, and even stand up here after all the good praise and worship. And uh, we just want to lean into a time of prayer. And you, you know the needs that, that you can see some of them in the bulletin. But it is time that the, that the gates of heaven are opened. The, the throne room is open here. And we're present before the Lord. So if you just bow with me. Well, Lord, first we, we remember the church that's not free in the world. That where people have affliction and persecution and imprisonment and death on account of the faith. So, Lord, your martyr church we lift up. Lord, we lift up the churches in our own community. Lord, where each, each pulpit and uh, the, the sermon is brought. Lord, bring ne people nearer to you. Let your truth be spoken. Let hearts be touched. Strengthen the hand of your churches to, to witness in this community and bring the love of Jesus and his presence that much nearer, that much more real, that much more manifest. Lord, we ask for our sick, and we name off in our hearts each one that we know. Lord, we name our cancer patients before you, the ones that are in remission, the ones that are currently in treatment. And we ask, Lord, for, for for each treatment to, to be effective, to, to find its, find it, the, that it really find its target. Lord, we pray for those that are hospitalized just now. Lord, we also pray for this week to come or this time where we're trying to figure out, well, what's to be done? What are the test results? How are things saying? And just help us, Lord, to walk through this without fear, trusting in you. Lord, al alongside we want to be alongside the families that, that the doctors don't have anything else that they can do that brings healing. And where families wait and watch, just ask your presence and your help be there. We ask your, your hand to be alongside of Mike Akers and his family. Lord, be with the friends of this church and the people we know that are, that are inside, that are in care facilities, that, that don't get out. And we ask, Lord, for them to have a great measure of your peace. But bless all our homes, Lord. Bless, the, bless us, Lord, to, to know peace and love between husband and wife, parent and child. Let your, your provision, your plenty, your blessing be upon our homes. Also, we pray for our community and for especially for those that are needy among us. Lord, guide our, our own hearts and our efforts and our gifts to, to those that have need and strengthen the hands of those people and groups in this community that minister to human needs. Lord, also, we bring before you our unspoken requests, what's on our heart. Lord, you know all about it, and ask, Lord, that you be merciful. Show, show this, this day to be a day of grace. Lord, build us up in strength to serve and, and also in hope. Lord, bless our nation, and just, Lord, to, to keep it protected and defended and free. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of living in this nation with its strength, with its security, and with its history. Just ask, Lord, that you guide us into your paths, that you be alongside those who serve in the military to shorten times that they're deployed, to also to, to give them success on their endeavors and what they're doing, Lord. But we pray for peace in the lands that are presently torn by war, that your help be along, among, alongside those driven, driven from their homes. Lord, for, for people that, for each item in the news, East Palestine and and. Uh, and Ukraine and so many places that, and the, and the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Lord, we, we, we just ask that you sh so much show your love. Let people see your deliverance in the midst of trouble. But Lord, also, we just turn to you in prayer, thankfulness. So much we have been blessed. And so we ask you, Lord, to be with us through the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today's for this service, you have to actually sort of keep, keep an eye on what's going on because there's two things here that, that don't, you know, we just started the last Sunday doing the Lord's, the, not the Lord's Prayer, but the, the 23rd Psalm together. And so we're, we're going to, to share in that just now because I want from now through Easter for us to say this together because it is our psalm. We, Jesus is our good shepherd. And uh, to take some time uh, yourself to reflect on something there, remember that, you know, he's the one who leads you beside still waters. He restores your soul. 
Now, you know there's somewhere we're missing something because there aren't that many people who, who just pop out with, well, this year my soul is a lot more restored and a lot more peaceful and a lot more... Built. No, we're, we're, we're a touch more negative than that. We are truly, my friends. And it's not to criticize. It's saying we need more of Christ. We need more Jesus. He is there. He is the shepherd who wants to build you up and strengthen you to meet your need with his grace. So let's say the the psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's all say amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I want to welcome to the, to the, the platform Dan Kaiser. Dan and Suzanne have been with us through the Sunday School Hour. They have been serving as missionaries in Italy, uh, in, the, in the Trieste area, planning churches and evangelism. So wanted to give him some time at, at this point to share a little bit about his work. So come on up. G- give him a hand. He, make sure he's discouraged, encouraged, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Harley, and thank you, congregation of Broadway Global Methodist Church. It is a privilege for me to be back here and uh, to see everybody once again. Last time that Suzanne and I were here uh, was about five years ago. And it's always interesting, whenever we return from the foreign mission field, we can uh, observe many Uh, interesting cultural changes in our home country. So it's always uh, adjusting when we return to the field in Italy or adjusting when we return back here to the U.S. of A. And uh, interesting, uh, I read your mission statement a few weeks ago, and uh, I really like it, your mission statement or your vision statement. Broadway exists to bring glory to God by striving for holiness and seeking the lost for Christ. Those are two uh, great goals for us to have as believers. And uh, I'm glad that is your, your goal, your mission. And uh, Global Mission Methodist Church, even your, the name of the church has changed since the last time I was here. But I'm reminded of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where uh, Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the earth. So even uh, a congregation like here in New Philadelphia, you can have an impact anywhere in the world, here in the community of Dover, New Philly, but also uh, to the othermost parts of the earth. And certainly I would include that to be the country of Italy. Um, We have this uh, tremendous promise from Jesus. And this is a verse that I've been using as we've been visiting our supporting churches in our time of uh, home assignment. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we find these words of Jesus in the first gospel, Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 18. This is the first time in the entire Bible that the word church is mentioned. Interestingly, it's mentioned one more time in uh, Matthew chapter 18, and that is the only time it's mentioned in all four Gospels. But once we get to the book of Acts and the epistles, the word, we find the word church mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. And the amazing thing is uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is the one who is building the church, the universal church, the body of Christ, and also the local church, just like this local congregation here in New Philadelphia that has been here for many years. 
and a new church that has recently been established overseas in the city of Trieste, Italy. And it was uh, September of 1999, it's hard to believe, almost 24 years ago, that the Lord opened the door for our family, my wife Suzanne and our three daughters, Sabrina, Sarah, and Claire, myself, to leave the Dover, New Philly area to begin a new adventure in serving him on the mission field. Our destination was the country of Italy and for the purpose of planning a church in the country of Italy, planning an evangelical church. We began our service in the Italian region of Umbria. That would be the central part of Italy. That's that green area kind of behind the kneecap of Italy. And uh, the region is called Umbria. It's also known as the Green Heart of Italy. It's a beautiful area. We really loved it there. And we were assigned to the city of Perugia. In the city of Perugia, we had our language, Italian language and culture learning. And from there, we went just a little bit north, still in Umbria. We were assigned to a church, and it was an evangelical church, Italian evangelical church. So all of the leadership all of the people in the church, with the exception of us, were Italians. And this was great because we learned how to minister, how to share the gospel with the Italian people. And then in September of 2007, our mission asked us to make a trip to go up north to the region of Fruli, Venezia, Giulia, and the city of Trieste. And as you can see, Trieste is a beautiful city. It's uh, right on the edge, the top of the Adriatic Sea. In the distance, in the background, you can see the country of Slovenia. And uh, Trieste is also surrounded by mountains as well. A beautiful city, but a very needy city. And the question becomes, what makes Italy a mission field? And what I can tell you is, uh, this is the Piazza Unita. And it's a large open piazza uh, just a 10-minute walk from our house. And you can see thousands of people in the piazza. And we have seen uh, even larger crowds there. But just imagine uh, <clears throat> the difficulty. In the country of Italy, there is uh, a church, the universal church, uh, one half of 1% of the believers in the entire country. So just imagine that, uh, one half of 1%. Believers. That's why Italy needs missionaries. And we could say the same for any of the countries in Europe, uh, France, Germany, England, Holland. The number of believers among the population is about one half of 1%. So it was our privilege to go there and work for the purpose of planting a church in this city. We praise the Lord because on June 26th of last year, 2022, after working in the city of Trieste for 15 years, we were able to turn the church over to the Italian leadership. Uh, a team of missionaries had worked together. We had worked and labored for 15 years and until this moment arrived where we were able to lay our hands on the new leadership, the Italian men who would be the elders of this church and the men who would be the deacons as well. The missionary work was completed, and uh, we were able to see God plant a church in the city of Trieste. This picture was taken our last Sunday in Trieste, which was August of last summer. And one of the things that the people in the church told us over and over again is thank, express our thanks to the people in your churches who have uh, made it possible for you to come to Italy and serve as missionaries. And so on behalf of the church body, the church family of this local church in Trieste, thank you for being part of our ministry. Thank you for helping us bring the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to the people of Trieste, Italy. Yes, indeed, and thank you for, for coming, for sharing today. Uh, make sure, to, if you have any other questions for Dan about, about the work, you can catch him here after the service. As we are pressing ahead, 
Uh, the text for the sermon is Psalm 34. And uh, it was best, as I looked at it, that we say Psalm 34 together. The Psalms are, are written as a, generally as a call and response to say these prayers as a church. And so uh, it's the white piece of paper in the bulletin that will get up on the screen. And uh, let's be a part of the reading of God's Word. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And Lord, we ask your blessing on the hearing just now of this scripture and the word that is preached. Amen. Now, uh, a preacher can come to be speaking out of Psalm 34 from two, two different ways. And, and I've come at it both ways this year because I, I was reading through the Psalms and came on Psalm 34 and I said to myself, this is... This is such a declaration of God's care of how there can be troubles and afflictions and you will be delivered from those that you can count upon God, walk with God, see, taste and see that the Lord is good. And also you can be in John chapter 19 where the crucifixion is being described, being, being, the story is being told and John says, and well, I'll, I'll read it to you. In John 19, verse, uh, beginning at verse 31, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, Jesus, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And I was, we we're going to pause there for a minute. I was uh, reminded that not only, not, a, not everybody knows the deal here. Uh, there are three people being crucified. There's a criminal on either side of Jesus, and uh, they've been hanging on the cross. But if, if they break the legs of those who are hanging on the crosses, their bodies will sag and they'll, they'll asphyxiate. They'll, they'll die of suffocation within just a minute or so. So the Jewish leaders didn't want Passover to start with three executed criminals on crosses outside the city. Say, well, if you could break their legs, they, they could be dead and we could, we could take them down. That was the deal. Okay, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, as indeed he was, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also might believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. 
which is the scripture he refers to is Psalm 34. Now, if you had only read up to that point in the gospel, you would say, well, I, I understand that, that Psalm 34 says not one of his bones will be broken, but Psalm 34 is about, is about deliverance. It is, it is about, you know, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him, and, and how is that man nailed to the cross, says how experiencing blessing. Um, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, saves a crushed in spirit, but their hearts are breaking as they watch Jesus die. Now, they yet could have proclaimed the promise of the psalm even before they knew that Jesus was alive. If you look at what, what the, the discussion would be or the grief and the, and, the, and the talk amongst the disciples on the Saturday after the crucifixion, Jesus is in the tomb. He has not been raised. You would talk over all the events. You, you know how it is when, when someone dies in the, in the expected and, and, and very, you know, in a way that's not a, a huge crisis, but they pass away. We talk about their passing. What happened? Who went to the funeral? Who, who, was, who did we see at the calling hours? What did they look like? All these things. And, and particularly if there is a, uh, a catastrophic de death that's... that's 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 got it's like an accident we will talk about all those all those sides of that accident and so so john would be saying and and they didn't break his legs he would truly say that i know i've been i've been with a with a very good friend who, whose daughter unfortunately had a had a, a a very bad car accident and there were a good number of broken bones but there was the the one arm, the one hand, not a scratch. We commented on that. I said, wow, that, that's amazing. You see, there is a truth in this that we don't understand why a tragedy, an evil should happen, some great misfortune, some great pain, some great trouble. We're not always told why. But the Bible would be clear that God limits even the scope of that evil. There are, there are limitations put on it. This is, this is a, a thrust in this psalm, that many are the afflictions. Indeed, there might be many, but the Lord delivers. The Lord has his hand even on the trouble that we are given. We are to declare those limits. We, we naturally know if we, if we see somebody come out of an accident that, and, and, and they're this whole one side, not, not a scratch, we will declare that. If a church catches fire and the Bible is not burned, which happens with a oh, really uncanny frequency, we say, look at that. We are declaring that God puts, sets limits even on the evil that men or Satan would do among us. And this points us to his deliverance, to his grace, to his greater work and his power. As John would say, and out of the wound in his side, blood and water. They would talk about this before Jesus raised and alive, came to them. And how would they talk about it after they knew that Jesus was alive? This is why John, when he's writing in that, do you get the idea that, you know, if he knew the words to We Are the Champions, he'd be singing it. You know, it's just kind of a, you know, so this, you know, the he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony, he's talking about himself, and he knows his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also might believe. He says, I saw that his legs weren't broken. I saw that out of his side came, came blood and water. I know that God has set limits even on this human evil, that God has worked this for a per redemptive purpose, and I can be all over Psalm number 34. Think about how John would look at that. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all those troubles. That one who had been betrayed, the one who had been denied, the one who we just, so many of us just stood around while they crucified him, the one who saw the indifference of the soldiers who just nailed one more man up on the cross, the one who was condemned because the, the authorities said, well, we're going to protect our stuff. The Romans are going to do this. The Jewish leaders are going to do this. Jesus can die on the cross. Good for all the people. This one 
was saved out of all his troubles. And those of us who grieved over him, whose hearts broke because we love this man better than any other, we're also saved from our troubles. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He knows that the Lord is good. Come, children, and listen to me. That would almost be, be lines from how John got to talking later on in his epistles. And it, it says, what man is there who desires life and loves many days? The answer is here. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord redeems the life of his servant. You see, the Psalms, as the prayer book of the Hebrew Bible, take life and are full of Christ once we know the fullness of his sacrifice on the cross, that he was the God's very son came to dwell among us to be the Messiah that we needed, to be the one to stand in our place in the place of death. So this, these psalms speak Christ. He speaks through them and they proclaim him. And so the Christian should just be all over this. There are many troubles, but God has set limits on, limits on these. There is evil afoot in the world that's more than just the evil that people could think up, but he won't allow his bones to be broken. And there is his righteousness and his faithfulness that I am going to see. That is where the Christian lives, declaring these things. You know, if you have this question put to you that, that I get, people care about me, so they ask me this question all the time. How are you doing? How's your day going? Now, please, I'm not telling you there are only one and only one or two ways you can answer that question. But there are two Christian answers to that question. And, and probably what you say at that point should reflect the Christian truth. How are you doing? How's the day going? Well, the first truth could be, well, hallelujah, God has equipped me to, for the tasks of the day. I know what is, I can see what is before me, and I will, I'm going to be glad to be able to do it because God has given me the grace and the gifts and the help, and it's going to get done. In other words, it's work, and I'm looking forward to doing it. I have that, that reaction a lot. I can see what is in front of me this day, and I say, this is, what I've, this is what I've lived all my life to do. That's a good day. How was your day? Okay, what do you do if it's not that? been quality has been uneven well I'm facing some things today that I do not have strength for and I do not see my way through and I am trusting Christ to deliver me that is the other Christian answer they're both true depending on the circumstances Either you have work and tasks and, and people to love and, and folks to talk to and, and, and things to share and you're equipped for all that and that's a big praise the Lord or it is beyond your strength and you are waiting for God's strength to come alongside you and deliver you. One or the other thing is going on. There are some non-Christians answers to this whole idea of how are you, how is your day? One is griping. Now I have all this work to do. Oh man, there's this stuff and I've got to clean that. This has to be emptied out and I've got to run the vacuum cleaner. The kid's got to be driven here and mom's calling. Can't believe she still needs me to do stuff for her. Now that's griping. If God has equipped you to do all these things, if God has set you in a place to minister to your children and your family well, if God has given you the ability to do the tasks at work, you should praise God. Otherwise, it's, I don't see how griping is a Christian answer of just ordinary work. I can only assume if you lived with Adam in paradise in the garden, yet you'd complain for having to work the ground there, which was Adam's job. The other answer is despair. Despair, which is not a Christian attitude. Despair is walking outside of faith. Oh, there is no hope. You wouldn't believe the problems that I have here. It cannot possibly be solved. I've got no way to do it. Don't despair. The people who walk in faith do not despair. 
How can you get into the, oh, this is awful. I don't, if Jesus is alive, and he is. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you know that Jesus is Lord and you, and, <clears throat> and you, have, you have confessed that he is Lord and you know that he is alive, well, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The, re the Lord redeems the life of his servant. You do not walk in an attitude of despair because the risen Christ makes hope the default setting. Now, as I just told you how you have to answer that question, how are you doing, I, I have to give you it's the spiritual instruction portion of the sermon. Just because there's, there's, a, there's a comment that people tell me, and it's been, it's so many, easily hundreds of times, and it might be in reference to how their day is going or what's been going on, and I, 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 I'm friends with a lot of people that have problems or sicknesses or, or things, and now and then you get somebody who says, it says in the Bible, God will not give you more than you can handle, but I don't know. Now, whether you, add, don't add, whether you add the I don't know bit is fine, but do you realize it does not say in the Bible that God won't give you more than you can handle? Now, illustration. The Lord, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Is that not part of that song? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, and then it does not read next, but the righteous will be able to handle any of them. That is not what it says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Quite definitely, we can be dealt something that is beyond our strength. A little reflection on life and how it has played out will, will make you see the truth of that. My brother, Paul, uh, remembers something from very clearly, as, as I do, from over 50 years ago. Uh, and he was three years older than me, so he was given the instruction in, in uh, general terms, do not let your little brother come to some sort of harm. He's not to run out in the street. He's not to, not to burn himself with matches or anything the boys might get into. Well, it was fall, and uh, we were quite young, and, and the trees had fallen from the leaves in the front of our house. So as good kids, we made a pile of leaves and we jumped in the leaves and we played in the leaves and we threw the leaves at one another. And then we raked the pile back together and then I was hanging, it's hard to visualize this, as I was hanging upside down from the tree above the pile. You know, with my legs hooked over the limbs. You remember doing that? I could not do that today to save, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so I'm hanging from the tree upside down over the pile of leaves and I'm sure I announced my intention. I'm just going to drop in that pile of leaves. I think how nice that'll be. Just whoosh down, you know. And I let go. You know, I dropped down head first into that pile of leaves. And the pile of leaves was not that big. The pile of leaves just telescope, right like that. And I hit the ground as hard as I possibly could right on the top of my head. And I got up. I moved. And Paul says, are you okay? Imagine what mom is going to say if he lets his little brother die under his watch. Are you okay? And I, and I was even, I, I couldn't quite talk. I, I must have squinched my wind. Uh, uh, that was, now, at that moment, is Paul given something that he's not able, able to handle? He is not equipped to handle this. It is more than he can handle on his own. That's the two things we're learning here. It is more than he can handle on his own. He has been given something by definition. He is not strengthened for that. He is not an EMT. He doesn't even know what to do. I said you learn two things. If somebody says, what is the deal with your pastor? You can say, he fell out of a tree onto his head as a child. And people say, oh, that explains a ton. So again, imagine Paul's joy when I was okay and I was breathing well and no harm was done and mom was never told. 
he might indeed say, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. But from this true story, it is abundantly clear to me that you will be dealt things that you're not able under your own strength to handle. This business of not being given something more than you are able to bear is a misquote of 1 Corinthians 10.18, where Paul is talking about temptation and is saying, if one is tempted, one is never tempted beyond what you are able to handle, but in each temptation, God will provide a way of escape. That is also a very important verse for young boys. It's another sermon. It's to be remembered. We all agree with, we all as young boys agreed with the truth of that. Every time we gave in to temptation, we knew there was a way around it. We just gave in. But we're misquoting that. We're, we're taking that concept. This is the hardships. These are the afflictions. These are the things we don't know why they're coming upon us. They are afflictions and they are hard. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians just gives a short list. It's in the 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 8. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not, for, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. His description of his day, his week, his career in ministry is to describe affliction, being perplexed, persecution, and being struck down. He does not say, I could handle it all. He says, we carry around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made known in our bodies, in our lives. We carry these afflictions. We, we bear along with Christ the sufferings that, are, that come upon the righteous in this world so that his glory might be seen in us. We will see affliction. We will see persecution. We will be in perplexity. We will be struck down. But we will not be destroyed. We will not be driven to despair. We will not be forsaken. And we will not be crushed. Not a bone of us will be broken in that sense. Because we will know that God sets his limits upon even what is his children are called to live and bear. And we will wait and see his faithfulness. This is the truth of what is going on. Now you know, though, that you will, you will have affliction, perplexity, it only takes a virus. And I'm not talking about the pandemic. I was 10 years into the, the pastoral ministry and, and doing the best I could. And I had like five children at home. I forget exactly how many. But it's like February. And one gets sick with the flu. And then another one. And then another one. And you begin to wonder after a while, how will I live the life? How will, how will I minister? How will I prepare for Sunday? How should I deal with the needs that are out there when I'm not sure? I'm, how, how contagious am I? Can I go see somebody in the hospital? Probably not. How shall I have a minute's peace? Look, somebody else is thrown up over there. This sheet needs wash. This, look at that one. They're listless. They're, oh, man, what's their fever? Like 109? Anyway, it's like it just kept on and on. If you have enough children in the house, you can have the flu for four weeks, man. And I looked at that, and I am perplexed. And we are afflicted. And we are struck down. And I really wondered what on earth God was doing. I will confess to you that I understand that we get afflictions, and I argue with God all the time about how long he allows them to go on. But I should go farther. You know, God set his limits on that. You, can even see, you didn't even actually get everybody in the house sick. How is that possible if the house is like filled with 12 trillion viruses? Everybody should, not everybody gets sick. It, the time is limited. You find out that things at church went on just fine, even though 
you were barely doing your job. It all worked out. And we need to walk into that kind of situation with this attitude. There will be troubles, but God will limit them according to his wisdom. He will use them to demonstrate his faithfulness. We will be delivered by his strength. There are things we are not going to be able to handle, but we will be delivered by his strength as he sets the limits even of what we're going to bear. This is 2,000 years of Christian experience, spiritual experience, and people who are earnest in prayer. You don't know sometimes what to do with, with an unremitting pain or disease that you know is not going to go away. But we are to say, Lord, I do not know what to do with this. I certainly cannot handle it. It is now given to you to use for your glory. Understand, you can talk about your sufferings be alongside the sufferings of Christ. Your afflictions being borne by Christ and given to him. And we will say that. Say, Lord, I don't know what to do with my poverty and my money problems. But... I'm now giving them to you so your faithfulness can be seen in this situation. Lord, I don't know what to do about my grief. I, do, I can't bear the grief and the loss that I've just had, but I'm giving it to you so that you can show your faithfulness in this situation. Lord, I don't know what to do about rejection. I don't know what to do about desire that is, 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 is unrelenting and never satisfied. I don't know what to do about the problems I am facing, but I'm giving them to you so that your faithfulness can be demonstrated. And we will all together understand that indeed the Lord redeems the life of his servants. Many are our afflictions, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. You know, the invitation is to put some reality to this idea of I'm giving that to the Lord, or I'm depending on the Lord. You realize you have things you can't handle, or you will meet them. And you're going to need his strength. God blesses us with being equipped for many things, but he does not equip us for all things because he will want us to lean upon him and his miracle power and his faithfulness and his love and allow his salvation to unfold in our lives. The altar is open to say, God, okay, this is now something that's, that's yours. Let me see your faithfulness, and I'll, I'll wait to see your faithfulness come out of this. Your, your glory to be praised. Because we exist in the hope of the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He is the payment for our sin, that blood and the water poured from his body for our salvation. That we can trust and understand his power. And then we lean upon him all the rest of our lives. Let's pray. Father, for, for your love and your care, we just do ask. Lord, I ask that you show mercy and kindness to all those who, who are deeply afflicted whose problems are large, whose pain does not go away, who seem to have a darkness in their lives that, that they're waiting for that light. Lord, we pray for all these, our brothers and sisters. But Lord, teach us to see your hand at work. Lord, call us to your place of prayer. Bring us nearer to your glory. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.